So my name is Natalie Molina Nino, and I want to say good morning. Welcome to the second annual Startup Columbia Festival. We're very, very proud to be your host for the second year. Um, on behalf of the Athena Center for Leadership Studies, um, we would like to tell you that the Athena, the Athena Center was a brainchild of Deborah Spar, who couldn't be here this morning. Um, she's the president of Barnard College, and it's led by Katherine Colbert who also happens to be the attorney who went to the Supreme Court in 1992 and is credited with saving Roe v. Wade. Catherine Colbert and I founded, co-founded Entrepreneurs at Athena, which is an organization charged with one single mission, and that is to level the playing field for women entrepreneurs everywhere. We take that mission very seriously. And because of that, let me move my mic, we are thrilled to have partnered with Columbia Business School sees CEO and CORE as part of a unified Columbia entrepreneurship community and is your host on the Barnard campus today. Thank you especially um, to Chris McGarry, um, to Richard Witten, to David Lerner um, for really doing the heavy lifting today. And then on our team to Abigail Lewis and to the Athena intern and Barnard senior Rebecca Deng for making us look good. Um, on the topic of making us look good, the most important thanks that I'd like to give is to all the students involved in today's events, and more broadly, to the students who are at the epicenter of our vibrant startup community on campus. While the startup world has a long way to go, I know I grew up in that world, New York City boasts twice as many women-led startups as Silicon Valley, and I would argue that the larger Columbia startup community is doing even better. I am so proud and grateful for the effort that went into the diversity that you'll see in our lineup today. Just as I'm proud of Eva Sasan, who graduated from Barnard last year. She was the first student to launch, success, launch and successfully sell her tech startup before even starting her senior year at Barnard. Or Jada Hawkins, Monica Powell, and Lauren Beltrone, the women running Barnard's very own web development agency, Athena Digital Design, whose first client was Nobel Prize winner Malala Yousafzai, Yes, Malala. Um, or Emily Ann Regal, a Barnard junior and a social entrepreneur who you may have seen on the cover of Seventeen magazine recently, and whose book chronicling her entrepreneurial adventures will be in stores nationally before the end of this year. If Athena's thriving entrepreneurial community is any indication of what innovation at Columbia looks like, then we all have a lot to be proud of. Columbia's startup community is different which is why today's lineup is different than anything I've ever seen before. You are a community that has the opportunity to get it right. You're an you have the opportunity to start fresh, to create a startup culture unlike anything we've ever seen. For that and for many more reasons, we are so proud to have you here at Barnard and at Athena. Thank you and welcome. Good morning. My name is Alex Ellis. I am on the board of CEO, Columbia Business School's entrepreneurship organization. CEO's mission is to create and maintain a supportive community that facilitates learning and risk taking. CEO should ensure Columbia Business School is an attractive place for established entrepreneurs and provide a spark and, and resources to enable aspiring entrepreneurs. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Sheena Iyengar. Sheena is the S.T. Lee Professor of Business. She joined this, the Columbia Business School faculty in 1998 and is currently the faculty director of the Lang Center for Entrepreneurship at Columbia Business School. Her core resource, re research focuses on the psychology of choice and decision making. Her research is regularly cited in popular media, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, and the BBC. Please join me in welcoming Sheena to the stage. Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to see all these awards, to see all the enthusiasm. I want to personally thank Richard Witten. He has done an amazing job here at, the, at Columbia University. Um, I mean, so much of the efforts of bringing together 
all the different schools to start collaborating with one another, creating courses where students from engineering, SEPA, the business school, undergrads, I mean, all of those efforts, the sort of spiritual leader behind that um, is, has been Richard Witten. And the change that's happened on this campus just in the brief time that Richard Witten's been here is enormous. So really, we, we owe Richard quite a lot. Um, let me just focus a little bit of time by telling you a little bit about what we've been doing at the Columbia Business School. It's a phenomenal time to be involved in the entrepreneurship program here at the Columbia Business School. Uh, in 1996, we had exactly one course in entrepreneurship. In this past academic year, we had 64 courses offered that had something to do with entrepreneurship. Um, courses that are quite esoteric in some cases, like digital investing or mobile tech entrepreneurship or real estate entrepreneurship. So really, really becoming very, very specialized in terms of what we're offering the students. We have over 45 instructors that teach, um, teach different entrepreneurship courses, including entrepreneurship, including um, social entrepreneurship, and other related topic areas. Think, Start, Grow um, is a quick way to summarize the kinds of course offerings we have at the Columbia Business School. Um, so really, it summarizes that we have three main areas in which we focus on. First, we want to give students an entrepreneurial mindset. So we today live increasingly in a very uncertain, changing, dynamic environment. You will be changing your careers multiple times throughout your life. And to, in order for you to continue to be successful, to be able to keep reinventing yourself, you will need to be able to have an entrepreneurial mindset. And we consider that to be the most important skill that we can offer you. And so we have a number of courses in the area of entrepreneurial mindset, teaching you how to think analytically, problem solving, connecting the dots. Glenn Hubbard talks a lot about the importance of teaching students how to connect the dots. That entrepreneurship is essentially the ability to connect the dots. We also teach students courses on innovation. For example, the co-founder of the Tribeca Film Festival um, has been involved in literally teaching a course on disruptive innovation. We have courses on uh, called the Entrepreneurial Game that literally gives students the opportunity uh, to take the perspective of an entrepreneur and a venture capitalist. We um, are currently developing courses on design thinking uh, to give you just a bit of a flavor of what kinds of things come under the think category. Um, in Start a Business, we increasingly have a lot of courses that take a very hands-on take on how to teach students entrepreneurship. So you're taught by academics and practitioners that come together. Uh, we, actually, we have courses that literally take people from how to go from an idea to a business model. Um, Dave Lerner has been involved as well in teaching courses that teach students that hands-on method, going from the idea to the business model, then taking students that go through a competitive process, sort of the jewels in terms of the students that have real ventures that could make it, and gives them very hands-on, personalized attention on how to take those businesses, getting them resources, getting them connections, so that by the time they graduate, they can go in front of a venture capitalist. Um, we also have courses in venture capital that gives students the opportunity while they're taking courses in venture capitalism, they're also uh, being placed in a company doing an internship throughout the semester. So some days of the week they're working for a company like Bain Capital and other days of the week they're in class sitting in on lectures. Finally, we also have the area of grow, and that's corporate entrepreneurship, which is that increasingly in order to be successful in an organization, large organizations, in order for large organizations to continue to be sustainable, they will need to have employees that are entrepreneurial, that bring a corporate entrepreneurial mindset to help that company continue to thrive. So that's a quick summary of the kinds of things we do at the Columbia Business School. We have a lot of courses that bring together students from across campus, so I encourage all of you to you know, take a little look at what kinds of things we're doing at the Columbia Business School. Thank you very much. We will now be kicking off today's first uh, panel building the New York City innovation ecosystem. Our moderator today is Erin Griffith. Erin is a journalist with Fortune. Previously, she worked as a staff writer for Pando Daily, Adweek, and PE Hub. 
and has written for Salon, the BBC, Venture Capital Journal, and the Huffington Post. Thanks. Is this, okay, good. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, all right, so I'm gonna let our panelists introduce themselves because I think they can explain to you what they do better than I can. So um, why don't you guys just go down the line and um, explain your role in the New York innovation ecosystem. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, good morning. My name is Katie Balot. Um, I'm the Vice President of Education and Workforce at the Partnership for New York City. Um, we are a business leadership organization made up of um, almost 30 CEOs um, who are you know, selected because they're dedicated to making New York City the best city in the world to live, work, raise a family, start a business. Um, my job at the partnership is to think about how we develop talent and how we position New Yorkers to compete for um, jobs in the innovation economy. So that, um, you know, takes a lot of different shapes and um, I look forward to expanding on it, you know, later down the line in the panel. You'll be able to hear from my colleague too, Maria Gotch, um, later this afternoon. The partnership fund for New York City um, invests seed capital in in startups, VC um, capital as well, and then also invest in distressed communities throughout New York City. So um, you'll you'll get to hear from her, and she'll speak more specifically to startups, VC. But cool, I'll be talking about talent. So. Brad, hi everyone. I'm Brad Hargraves. I'm a co-founder of General Assembly. Uh, we empower individuals to pursue work they love by teaching topics in technology, business, and design. Things like web development, user experience design, digital marketing topics that are traditionally uh, not taught in most universities, but are highly, highly in demand in the workforce. Um, I also uh, am a venture partner where I invest with Maveron, uh, General Assembly's first and lead investor. Cool, Don. I'm Don Barber, and I co-founded New York Tech Meetup, which is um, the largest meetup in the city, but also the world, actually. Um, and uh, is, is run by, we have a fabulous executive director uh, now, um, Jessica Lawrence um, and 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 a wonderful board uh, of which Dave Lerner at Columbia is is on our board. Um, we uh, New York Tech Meetup is is really kind of has uh, people have said to me kind of the heart and soul of of the New York Tech ecosystem. Um, I've uh, been involved in the New York Tech ecosystem since the late 90s, actually. Um, so I'm involved in a lot of different ways. I'm on the board of an organization called Mouse uh, Insight. I don't know if there's any Insight students here, Columbia and, and Barnard. Um, anyway, so I've, uh, you know, I've sort of seen a lot of the... How many, how many members is the New York Tech Meetup up to now? New York Tech Meetup now is 43, over 43,000 members, yeah. Which it started awesome. uh, 10 years ago with um, actually just me as the first member. Scott Heiferman started the organization and, and I was the only one who showed up in the first time. <laughs> so there is something for just showing up. <laughs> ten, you, 10 years later, 43,000 members, yeah. Yeah, and it's impossible to get tickets to uh, unless you have an in. Yeah, it's, you know, we're, we're working on that. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, cool, so let's start off by just kind of talking about what is the state of innovation in New York right now? What do, you, what do you guys see? I feel like five years ago there was a huge kind of resurgence and a lot of uh, momentum was building up. It happened to coincide with the financial crisis also. Um, a lot of people sort of losing their jobs and thinking about, you know, starting companies. Um, but, you know, there's been sort of rumblings about some of that momentum having been lost over the last couple of years. And so I'm curious um, where you guys see things right now. Sure. Well, just to jump in on that, I mean, and, and Don, I'd be interested in your perspective too, having been hanging around New York Tech for, uh, you know, since the late 90s. Um, but, you know, I look at it as, you know, five years ago, seven years ago when I, when I, when I moved to New York, um, you know, we went to, went to the New York Tech meetup, and I think back then it was at Cooper Union, and, you know, it was 100, 150 people. And I think there's no question that the profile and visibility and just sheer size of the tech ecosystem in New York has just risen 
tremendously, and that's been an incredibly powerful thing for the city. Um, you know, five years ago, there were very few tech spaces, co-working spaces, you know, those, those really didn't exist in New York, and, the, and certainly not in the way they do today. So there's clearly been some just fundamental secular changes over the last five years that are continuing. That said, in comparison to uh, most West Coast cities like Seattle, San Francisco, even to a lesser extent Los Angeles, um, New York has seen relatively few big tech exits. And uh, I think we're, we'll talk a little bit later about why that might be. Yeah, well, I'll just jump in to um, uh, just um, argue a little bit with my, my friend Brad here because uh, I'll just say a couple things. You know, for one, I can't stand the comparisons to the Valley in particular. I'll say that I feel like... Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, New York is a special place. I, I, I'm a New Yorker, so I, I, I'm pro-New York. Um, New York's a special pro place. We do things our way. Now, I'm not a VC, and, and, I, and I don't run a, a tech company, so I don't have skin in the game in that way. So I understand, yes, everyone, certainly the investors, you know, want the big... Uh, you know, the, the big money exits and, and all that stuff. But to me, New York is, is awesome because, and our, our, our tech uh, uh, ecosystem is awesome. You know, even back then in the late 90s, maybe we weren't on the map in the same way with the media. But, you know, I remember Fred Wilson early on. You know, Fred's been working for a long time. It's like even before he started his blog, you know, he's been in that space. There's a lot of other wonderful VCs in New York, uh, a lot of great venture firms, and there are a lot of great tech companies. You know, it, some come and go, and, and that's tough. But we've got Etsy. I mean, you know, uh, $3 billion exit, uh, IPO rather, just recently. So, you know, New York's the shit. We do it our way. Um, <laughs> you know, we've got the create, yeah. You know, we've got creativity, and so we don't have the back end in the same way. Anyway, I'm talking yeah, so too I, much. I mean, look, I, <laughs> I love New York. Right. I live here. Yes. Like, this is my city. <laughs> the, that said, given the population of the city, you know, you compare it to the total volume of venture exits in San Francisco or Seattle, like, it's, it, it just is not, it doesn't keep up for its size. And I think, you know, looking at, you know, whether that's a good or a bad thing, I mean, you can debate the values of that. Um, but certainly when G General Assembly, my company, got to a certain size, um, you know, we found, you know, up to a certain point, we could find everything we needed in New York in terms of, uh, in terms of talent, in terms of access, like being in New York was a huge benefit. And then we got to a certain size, like, you know, 400, 500 employees. There are actually relatively few executives in New York that have seen companies go from, you know, growth stage uh, you know, doing real revenue to being a, you know, pub large public company uh, that can, very few people have actually executive wise have seen that full arc. Um, and that actually, we've had to import all of our executives or many of our executives from the West Coast. Well, so good. I hope they stay here in New York. We, we can discuss this for a very long time. I hope they <laughs> yeah. stay in New York too. So talent, so talent is definitely something that, that we should, that we should talk about. But um, let's go back to the, the comments that you guys made about exits um, because, you know, that is obviously what investors um, need. And so my colleague, um, Dan Permack lives in Boston and he recently wrote a story that was like, are we, is New York tech hype over? Um, and, and, and he was mostly talking about the exits, like that we don't have those big exits. How, how important is that? Well, I would say it's, it depends on what perspective you're coming from. I mean, New York is still, I think, way more collaborative, way friendlier, uh, and more has way more creative more talent exactly. than those West Coast cities. So in that respect, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter at all. Mm -hmm. I think in the respect of building companies that are actually going to create a lot of jobs, um, you look at many of the big West Coast tech companies, they're creating you know, tens of thousands of jobs, hundreds of thousands or millions in the aggregate. Um, you, know, you, you, you need a certain scale in order to get there. Um, and, and that's, I think, going to be the real question of kind of the next two or three years. Mm -hmm. All right, so, uh, 
So we have talked about how New York is awesome, um, and everybody agrees, but let's talk about the things that we need. So we need more exits, perhaps. We need, um, we, ha we need talent. We need, uh, like, what, you know, what have you encountered as you've grown General Assembly that uh, New York just doesn't have? You mentioned talent, what else is there? Yeah, I mean, talent is obviously a big thing. I would say, you know, in terms of engineering and design talent, New York is far ahead of where it was five years ago when that oh, was really? just, when, when that was actually a, a, a major, major limiting factor um, for growth. I think, mm -hmm. you know, programs um, going into, uh, you know, going into K through 12 and emphasizing computer science, which uh, Katie, I'd love to, uh, I'd love to get your perspective on, um, have had, have had a real, real impact on that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So let's talk about let's talk about why we're four, five years ahead on uh, or that five years later that we're far ahead of where we were on talent. Um, so I think the the acknowledgement and kind of the renaissance of um, employers. Well, I guess you know New York City as a as a community saying, okay, we're going to have to do better about getting employers into schools earlier and really understanding, you know, the the way that we're going to prepare students in a more, um, to be more comprehensive, entrepreneurial, um, think fast on their feet. And there's a number of different initiatives. I think the most, um, you know, touted is Pathways in Technology, Early College High School in Crown Heights that is a partnership with IBM, the C City University of New York, and the Department of Ed. Um, very, very few people know that there's now seven of those schools in the city. Um, and they are all tech focused. They all have a lead employer. Um, and they're really preparing students over a six year, um, over six years, including two at the back end that are a free associate's degree at a CUNY college, uh, to be, you know, our new, new employees for, for startups and to really know about coding and computer literacy and, you know, to be able to think quickly on their feet and have the soft skills and kind of be the whole package and compete for good paying jobs. So, I, you know, that's really exciting. Yeah, I, and I think that's exactly right. I think, we, you know, you ask what, what's needed. One of the things that's needed is, uh, is education. So we have to prepare. Again, I don't want our great New York uh, students, kids, people leaving for the West Coast. I'd rather have them stay here. So we've got the, you know, Cornell Technion campus being built. You know, I want New York kids to be able to go there. And we, so that's great that that campus is being built, but we sort of haven't, we, we kind of need the, the other side. And so we need to, and of course it would be great if it was our public school kids in particular, because, you know, again, New York. Um, and so I think all those education programs, it, you know, I think we have to just keep going on that. Um, and, and, and I think even further down the line, I, I, you know, uh, third, fourth grade, you know, they have to start learning design thinking, um, code, uh, in combination, all that. Can I just, to that point, Don, yeah. um, you know, we're really lucky to have a city administration who, who gets it and who is very, um, you know, committed through things like the Tech Talent Pipeline, um, the new office of... The props to Kristen Titus. Yep, props, we, we love Kristen. Um, the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development to really think about, um, you know, how we can aggregate employer efforts and really, you know, do more better um, and get, and better, you know, better connect. We talk a lot about real feedback loops, but that's really hard to achieve um, at scale. So they, they get it and they're, they're all hands on deck and there's a lot of exciting things happening. Um, so there's all these great programs out there. How does a startup uh, learn about them and actually, you know, work with the administration, which is clearly so encouraging of startups, but I would guess that your average founder who's out there, you know, kind of applying to accelerators or thinking about going to General Assembly for a class doesn't really even know how to penetrate <laughs> those programs. Come to New York, take me now. <laughs> Start there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I would also say that many of the programs uh, that, you know, the current administration is working on and that have the biggest impact, I know that uh, the partnership is working on as well, are, are not necessarily targeting people who are already working on a company saying, I want to be a founder. Uh, they're not really for that audience in a way, and I think that's a good thing. That is, they're much more for the public school student at PS something in Queens that, like, doesn't even think that the tech world is accessible to them at all and hasn't even gotten that 
idea of forming a company or learning a, a, a technology skill and joining a company on their radar. And you know, one thing that, that you know, we've really done over the last you know, three years at General Assembly is refactor a lot of our programs to address an audience that is not an entrepreneur. Uh, because we want our students to actually be able to go out and get a job where they can continue to hone their skills. Um, and that is really what many people want. And I think by increasing this accessibility of education, skills training, and really letting people who never thought that that world would be this world, our world, would be open to them, um, reaching them is actually, I believe, uh, a very, very powerful thing. Uh, because if you're already a founder, you're already out there talking to accelerators, um, you know, you're probably going to succeed or fail based on, you know, the quality of your execution, the quality of your ideas. I think our time, like, you know, if you're looking at social impact, it's much better focused on someone who doesn't even know what an accelerator is. Yeah, I totally agree with that, Brad. And I'd say, you know, again, um, uh, Katie and I were talking, you know, even here in New York, CUNY students aren't even... Um, uh, often and and even sometimes the the CS students are not always integrated into our sort of tech world. So we that's on us. I think we have to do a better job of of getting the word out, of of reaching out to them too. Um, and and I think also you know kind of reaching out to the other other boroughs. You know it's not all in our um, Flatiron area, which is which is great. But we need to go you know right actually sort of close to here. Uh, these these uh, sort of new friends of mine, um, uh, Clayton Banks and, and Bruce Davidson, um, have started something called Silicon Harlem, uh, which is awesome. You know, it's a space. It's a you know uh, a space to talk about tech to to bring our whole scene sort of uptown a little bit. And I think it's important for us to go there too. Certainly, they have to come and you know come to New York Tech Meetup and you know GA and and stuff too. But you know, it's all, it's getting better. Of course, it can't always happen fast enough for, for us impatient tech people, but. That's, impatient New Yorkers. Yeah. <laughs> that so um, that's a perfect segue of just, um, you know, the, the idea of the panel and, you know, thinking about developing this robust ecosystem, you know, really, you know, my job is to, to really pound home that it starts so much earlier than I think, you know, we, we need to get, um, you know, the brightest minds, the most entrepreneurial people like into schools, you know, primary schools, middle schools, we have opportunities to do that through, the, you know, more vastly expanded after school programming. Um, you know, today, currently, there's 300,000 public high school students, of which about half elect to take a career in technical education course. The vast majority of those CTE courses are tech focused. There's um, the Academy for Software Engineering, there's the Bronx Academy for Software Engineering, there's tons of virtual enterprise simulated kind of entrepreneurial programs online, all of the students need mentors, they all need internships, um, they all need to build their own personal network so they can go out and really, you know, attach to the labor market and have the support that they need to succeed. So um, that's kind of my plug today. Um, so uh, how will we know when those programs are working? How do, you, how do you kind of measure the success of that kind of stuff? Well, the big, I mean, one of the things that, you know, we need tech minds to think about is how to um, build systems that allow city agencies to talk to each other in real time, how we um, you know, maintain confidentiality of students while we really determine whether or not public high school students, New York City public high school students are in fact you know, in, in succeeding in their CUNY courses, are in fact attaching to the labor market, are in fact earning a living wage. So we don't have, I mean, we live in a, in a world of very fragmented public systems that, that don't talk to each other and are antiquated, and we, um, we need to do better about, about tracking outcomes. Yeah, I mean, I would say that this is very near and dear to my heart, as I've uh, spent a lot of time thinking about the metrics that underlie General Assembly and how do we think about the efficacy of our programs. And, you know, the key metric we watch is uh, placement into a full-time job within 90 days of graduation. Um, and that tends to be between 90 and 95 percent for our full-time program yeah, graduates. That's great, Brad. That's uh, good. But I, I think you know one challenge that we are going to face, and we have to be vigilant about, is how do we keep that number high while increasing the accessibility and diversity of our programs? So we announced uh, a new partnership with Capital One about two months ago, 
um, for several hundred thousand dollars in scholarships uh, to General Assembly programs for underrepresented groups, women, minorities, and veterans um, in technology. And I am very interested to see, uh, and you know, we need to kind of build an infrastructure around kind of how do we make sure we're maintaining that same outcomes level and quality threshold as we grow and as we admit groups that may not be as familiar with very basic things like interviewing techniques, um, like some of the soft skills that you know people need to, to get a job in the tech industry or any industry. How do we expand our programs to teach things like that as well? Yes, yeah, and you know one of the things I'll just say in in terms of on the diversity uh, front is, um, of course, that's you know that's that's great, uh, Brad. That work that you do and and your attention to that um, is laudable. Um, but I also think, you know, in addition to that, you know, we really have to get our um, our our money, our VC firms, and our investors to maybe get a little bit uncomfortable and be a little more inclusive in, in, the, in the folks that are in charge of that money. Because until that happens, it's hard to invest in, in folks that don't um, look like you. And so I think that we have to I expand that uh, on that front as well. And not always easy and not always comfortable, but... Um, well, how important. important is it that all of the entrepreneurs uh, and, and the startups that come out of New York are, are venture backed? I mean, this is a that's a really high risk game, and I, f I feel like oftentimes the non VC backed startups or the or small businesses or entrepreneurs, you know, don't really get a lot of credit. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if that's I, something you guys absolutely. <laughs> I completely agree. I mean, the vast vast majority of companies that are started, and I would say including the vast vast majority of companies that take venture money, mm -hmm. should actually not be venture funded businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, and probably. You know, it, you that's have, rich coming from a VC-backed uh, founder. <laughs> uh, yeah, from a VC and a VC-backed founder. I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, I look at this as, you know, taking venture dollars makes sense if, you know, no outcome below a, you know, multi-hundred million or ideally a billion-plus dollar outcome is what you as an entrepreneur are going for. That is, if someone comes to you in 24 months and says, hey, here's $50 million, can I buy your business? Uh, if you're going to say yes to that, don't take venture money. Um, and the vast majority of people would say venture, would say yes to that because it's a life-changing amount of money um, for most people. Uh, so I, I totally agree with you that you know, VCs own too much of the dialogue around entrepreneurship. Way too much of it is focused on like taking VC dollars as an outcome in and of itself. Um, I'll, rather take, I'll than, take some blame for that as, as a member of the media. Absolutely. This is, this is I believe, that is about 50% VC's fault and about, and about 50% the media's fault. Um, and I think it's, it's led to too great of an emphasis on taking venture money, and therefore you see many companies taking venture money that should not get it. And I think that what we really need to see is a diversification of capital sources um, where you know, you've seen, right. kind of traditionally it's been, you raise from friends and family or you raise venture money. Um, and I think we're, we're going to start to see kind of more creative uh, capital structures for <laughs> entrepreneurs. Okay, so we've talked about talent, we've talked about money, we've talked about diversity, we've talked about education. Um, what, else, what else is holding New York back right now? What are the biggest barriers facing the New York tech innovation ecosystem? Oh, hold the mic up. We talked about a lot of it. You know, it's the education. I, I think we have to be um, just continue along the path of, of being open to innovation and, um, you know, in, and inclusiveness in that. Um, uh, I mean, are there some like logis uh, basic logistics like real estate, for example, yeah. is, a huge, is a huge problem in New York? Yeah, I think, there you, go. you know, I think <laughs> five years ago, uh, commercial real estate was the biggest the biggest issue mm -hmm. that is you know that if you wanted to start a business and create and have an office you pretty much had to either find a company with some spare space who was willing to sublet it to you or go get a lease yourself which was an incredibly difficult painstaking uh, and often costly process expensive exactly. expensive yeah <laughs> um, and I think today actually in both New York and San Francisco 
uh, the biggest barrier to growth is residential real estate. Mm -hmm. um, that is housing. I was talking with uh, Mark Neger, the, the, the executive director of Up Global, the largest entrepreneurship organization in the world. They run Startup Weekend. And he was like, housing is the number one issue that our members face. Uh, that is, it's painful for an entrepreneur to get a lease. I mean, in New York City, you have to show uh, two years of tax returns demonstrating 40x the monthly rent in annual income, which is kind of crazy given that you can do the math on that. Um, <laughs> and so it's, it's a really, really painful process. So actually, I'm, uh, I'm working on a project uh, to um, create some more affordable housing for entrepreneurs and creatives in the city. Ooh, you want to expand on that? Can, can you tell us about it, or is it still secret? Still secret. Not right now. Okay. Just working on it. <laughs> Very Ask me in two months. <laughs> okay. But yeah, I'll also just add, Brad, that in addition to that, when you get older um, uh, founders or, or even managers, then the whole um, education in, in, you know, is just tough. It's just crazy expensive. New York's crazy, you know, um, and it's a, it's a small footprint with a lot of people all on top of each other, so it's, it's tough. All right, now I want to ask a question that you guys submitted to me, which I think is just a really great question, and I want to re read it verbatim. Um, the rise of technology in San Francisco has led to painful social conflict and class mistrust. Is New York City resigned to a similar fate if and when we see those massive exits? Can New York City avoid the technology industry contributing to the housing shortages plaguing the Bay Area? Well, it's a, it's a mount, it's, it's also my question. Good um, question, so, Brad. <laughs> so uh, it, 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 I'd say it, it sounds a lot better on, on paper than it, than it sounds really complicated. Um, so yeah, so the, the idea I was, I, was, I was getting at with, with, with that was, you know, you've seen uh, a lot in the news lately about, you know, this really class conflict in San Francisco where you have, There's you know, protest, yeah, you Google have protests buses. Yeah, in front of the Google buses. You know, they're burning effigies of Kevin Rose. It's like, it's, it really has taken on a, a very bitter tenor that you didn't even really see with the Occupy protests even. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's, it's, certainly, it's certainly scary. And, you know, we haven't seen that same level of anger at tech in New York. And I think Which I'm very glad of. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, you know, for one, we have the finance industry that, you know, it's, takes all the heat for us. Um, <laughs> and yeah, and to that, uh, sorry to interrupt you, Brad, but to that point, I think what is great about New York, again, is that tech isn't the only sector. You know, we're kind of kept honest by not being the only sector. We've got a lot of sectors that th that are top dog. There's, you know, finance and fashion and media. And, and, and so I think that actually is a good thing for everyone. Um, and I, and, you know... But, but in all seriousness, we have this hyper awareness of income inequality right now. And, you know, where we are four years from today, I still think that we're going to have a, there's going to be, um, that, that will have helped in thinking through, you know, if there are potential massive exits and we're, we're you know, what we're learning today is going to stick. And again, we're not a, such a monoculture, right. you know, they're just such a monoculture and it, you know, and we're better. Yeah, I mean, no, I, and I mean, I, I think they're you know they're they're building all these all these crazy like towers uh, in in Midtown. I'm sure many of you have heard of these like mm -hmm. massive developments. And you know, if I were living in one of those, I would much rather be living next to like a you know. And I think most people, I'm going to speak for most people in this case, I'd rather be living next to like you know an entrepreneur than you know a Russian oligarch or a you know 26 year old son of a Taiwanese land speculator who there who's there for like you know, 70 days a year. So it's, uh, you know. No I, offense if there are any in the audience. No, no offense. <laughs> None taken out. No, no offense at all. But um, so, you know, that, that's, I, I think New York has the housing stock also to, to absorb some of, you know, even if we do have a few big exits. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, but just to play devil's advocate, are, am I hearing that, that we don't want the next Facebook or that we don't want a Facebook size exit? I, I'm not saying that at all. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that it has to, I think it's an interesting conversation to ask, well, and assuming that New York has a Facebook type exit, mm -hmm. uh, what happens and how do we, in that case, avoid the same problems and, that San Francisco's And I think having? it's not about the Facebook exit. It's, again, it's about, built, our ecosystem is just different and being built, it's built differently from the beginning. It's, you know, I, I say this, 
Etsy couldn't be any other place but where it is, and mm -hmm. that's awesome. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a um, Kickstarter and Meetup and Foursquare mm -hmm. and you know a lot of these uh, LearnVest and you know it's it's just these are are very New York centric companies as they should be. You know, again, I don't as I said before because I don't have skin in the game, not on the investor side, not on the entrepreneur side, it's easy for me to say, mm -hmm. I like it the way it is, you know? Um, but again, I, I, I do think it's it's awesome and there's so much creativity and it's the perfect ground for real innovation and creativity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, David Karp is a New York guy. So mm -hmm. Tumblr's a perfect New York company. You know, he's creative and interesting. He's also geeky and techy and he, he built a company for himself. Um, you know, that, that obviously is shared with a lot of people and done quite well. So we can, we'll take your money, West Coast, but we'll stay here. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, I mean, so I, I'm curious what, uh, I mean, we're all obviously very positive on New York, um, and yet we still see people, you know, graduating and moving out to the West Coast to build their companies. So what, what else can we do to keep them here? <laughs> Well, like I said before, I think the education, I mean, you know, Brad's doing his part. Like, I, I, I think the education part is important. I, I think the real estate part, I mean, I, I think some of the things we've covered, you know, we've just got to make it um, continue to make it um, comfortable for entrepreneurs. But what I always say about New York, which I think is crazy, it's like, it's actually not easy. Like Brad said, the, you know, rents are crazy. It's hard to move here. It's really crowded. <laughs> and yet people keep coming here and want to stay here. Why? Because New York's the shit. Because we're awesome. <laughs> because it's so creative and interesting. And there's so many different, um, you know, cultures and, and, and people with different perspectives. And it's, you know, that that's obviously attractive. So... <laughs> One, one thing that I think is really interesting about the New York Tech Meetup is there's a, I don't know if you guys haven't been there, there's a rule that um, you can't ask the person who's demoing their product uh, what their business model is. And if you ask, everybody boos. <laughs> um, and, and so can you maybe explain the thinking behind that? Because I think it's really interesting um, and it's kind of almost like a Silicon Valley mindset that is a little bit foreign sometimes to people who are more business minded in New York. Um, yeah, well, I mean, it, it started when uh, Scott Heiferman and I started New York Tech Meetup. Uh, it started because we just wanted to put people who were creating cool stuff um, up there to share um, with, with the community. So it's not about a business plan. It's not about a sales pitch. It's not about your personal story. There's so many other places to say that and to do that. And so it's just New York Tech Meetup is just not one of them. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's just show your stuff. You know, it's all about the demo. It's show what you got. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> one of the reasons I, I love New York and I'm very <laughs> bullish on the New York tech ecosystem is because you do have a lot of people here who value having a business model and, <laughs> you know, value, uh, you know, unit economics and things like that. And I, I, I like that. And, and, and I think that's a, that, that's a positive thing and I think that uh, if you're looking to build sustainable long-term businesses, you know, we look at General Assembly as like a 70, 75 year plan. Like we want this to be around when our alumni who are graduating right now retire. And that is, you know, that requires like a business model that's built around sustainability and not hype. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to open it up to the audience if there's any questions. Um, and if, if not, I can continue to ask questions. But all right, what's going on here? Got another mic. If anyone has questions, I guess, yeah, you guys could line up there or maybe raise your hand. Oh, go ahead. I'm not sure either of those mics work. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Oh, there's you one back there, it. too. Uh, um, Thank you very much for your comprehensive answers. Um, the question for Brad and others, um, can New York has a Facebook-like company from the perspective of the weather? Uh, San Francisco, you have a lot more sunny days. New York, obviously, you have a lot of <laughs> snow. And um, also the time difference. Um, if you compare to um, Asia, um, it's about 12 hours difference. But uh, for San Francisco, about six hours. Also logistics, um, travel is about eight hours flight to Asia is about 
13 hours for New York. So all the, those factors, can you just share with us? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would say there are some businesses and some lifestyles for which it makes more sense to be on the West Coast. I would say if you're doing a lot of business in, uh, in East Asia, it makes more sense to be on the West Coast. If you're doing a lot of business in Europe, it makes more, more sense to be on the East Coast. I mean, you know, London is a six and a half hour flight from New York. It's a, what would it be, 11 hour, 12 hour flight from San Francisco. So it's, uh, you know, if, if you're thinking about, it's just really what you're doing and what your business is. And I'd give you a similar answer on the lifestyle question around, uh, around weather. Is like if, if, like if you want it to be 60 and sunny or 60 and foggy every day, then you, you should be in San Francisco. Um, and there's, there's no way, there's no way around that. I mean, you know, New York is, uh, can be pretty, pretty brutal on the weather side, but you know, I happen to love going to a party and, you know, having people in law and people in finance and people in medicine and people in art and people in music, uh, rather than everyone in, you know, fin financial tech and art tech and music tech and tech tech. <laughs> And Four Seasons are nice, too, for those who appreciate that. Um, I think we had a, a question back there. Actually, if you could come over here and line up behind me, um, that would be easier. <laughs> this is a little bit of a, a broader question, but it pertains to New York as well, and it's from a parenting point of view. Some, some of the best schools we even have, and I, I came from Montgomery County, Maryland, and now I'm in northern Westchester, they're, they're, our kids aren't getting cultural messages to want to work for a company like a Facebook or Google or find, found the next one. It's shocking to me. They're not getting the tech education, but they're also not getting the media and cultural messages. They use all the technology, but it doesn't translate to, oh, now I want to go work for a company like that. How do we change the conversation in New York and other places so that our kids are really excited about doing that instead of being the same place when they graduate high school that frankly we were 30 years ago, we being me? I don't know how to do it, but my kids aren't going that path. Are they not watching Silicon Valley on HBO? <laughs> they are not. <laughs> anyway, so that's one of the thoughts on um, So I think it's really important that you know private, parochial, public, um, schools open their doors and are better about, um, you know, talking about opportunities for nonprofits, employers, parents who maybe even don't have kids enrolled at the school um, can get, you know, can contribute. It takes a village is, is you know, my mantra when it comes to uh, public, uh, all education in New York City. Um, and then on the other side, you know, I think it's really important to well, you know, the partnership right now is, it has a very strong relationship with City Hall around thinking through infrastructure um, changes to make it easier for employers to engage. Um, you know, I don't think it's clear if you're someone who wants to volunteer in, in a New York City public school and help, you know, develop a tech program, after school program, where you would go. Um, so we need to be better as a city of really, you know, having one brand and, and reaching both, you know, out and both ways, having schools reach out, supporting schools and doing that, and then having um, you know, employers and, and from a range of different sectors understand the, the value of their contribution and then how they contribute, so. Yeah, and I, and I just think also that it's not about kind of um, funneling kids into, um, you know, uh, well, particularly Facebook, but you know, any right. company, at all, it's you know, it's about getting them excited about learning science if they love science, math if they love math, reading if they love reading, all three, you know, whatever. It's about you know getting that excitement so that then if they want to become entrepreneurs, that that that's a path that becomes clear to them. Um, that if they want to be working for an entrepreneur, that that's a path that becomes clear to them. You know, that it's just, it, it, it's excitement about, um, about also the world they live in. Again, when you're in New York, it's kind of all around you and, and you see it. I think it's a little more difficult. That's another thing. I think it's a little more difficult in the, in the valley to, you know, sort of see. You have to drive places. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the advice I normally give is that, you know, if, you, if you're a parent or if you're a community member, your school in your neighborhood probably has a school-based advisory board. 
So that's like a really good place to start. If you have something to contribute, going to the principal and saying, could I come to a meeting? You know, I want, I want to make sure that our kids are exposed to tech. <laughs> Simple as that. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Hi. Um, I noticed that the, the title for this panel was Building an Innovation Ecosystem, and that the word technology was not necessarily in it, but I think many of us and many of the panels I go to about innovation kind of conflate technology and innovation. And I'm curious to hear from you all if there's any risk in doing that, and perhaps we might be narrowing our perspective to tech solutions for problems that might need more than tech solutions? That's a good question. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point and a great question. I mean, yeah, I, I think, you know, the, the, this whole idea of the tech industry uh, is almost somewhat somewhat flawed in its, in its construction, in that a lot of the things people loop, like, bundle into the tech industry are not really tech companies. Like, General Assembly is not really a tech company. Like, we get called a tech company all the time, but we're an education company that teaches technology topics, but at the end of the day, we're a, you know, we're first and foremost a, a brick and mortar business, and we have online components that help us scale that business and help us grow and help us get operational leverage, but, you know, at our core, we're not a technology solution. And I think many of the, the hardest problems to solve today uh, are not, don't need pure technology solutions. Uh, they often need, you know, social solutions or business solutions or financial solutions uh, that might be enabled by a technology layer. I mean, it's, it's kind of the same thing with the de definition of the word startup and, totally. and you know, Mark Andreessen's whole software is eating the world thing. It's like, well, every industry now needs to understand software and needs to be innovative in some way, even if they're not a technology company or a platform. Um, but anyways, all right, go ahead. Hi, thank you so much. Um, two quick questions. So the first one targeted to you, John. Um, so I have been to several New York tech meetups and they're always a great experience. Um, one thing which is very interesting though is that at the beginning it's always highlighted that the word business plan or sort of business model should sort of be refrained from speaking about. Like I know that New York tech meetup very heavily focuses on the technology. So I'm curious to know from your perspective kind of like what the thought process is behind that and sort of how that plays in the companies that are selected. And then, Brad, to you specifically, um, I've taken GA class and had a great experience. Um, luckily, I had company subsidization because they can be relatively costly. So just sort of generally, I know there are lots of ways to become well-versed in technology, ranging from priced offerings to free offerings like Code Academy. So just generally, how do you guys view sort of the cost of that technological education? Um, yeah, you know, like, like I said before, New York Tech Meetup is just, um, you know, we started that model from the very beginning of just kind of, you know, demoing and showing your stuff. So it's not about uh, your business model. It's about really just sharing what cool thing you're working on. Um, I think in the early days, it was actually much less, uh, it, was, it, it was sometimes people working on stuff like even as a side project without a um, focus on, it might not be a, a, a company one day, and it might even not be, it might be a humorous thing even. Um, you know, I think because as it's become a, more of a popular thing to do, that, that people um, often want to use it as a, as a platform to, to share. And, um, and so, but, you know, that's, again, what I said before, you know, there's, there's plenty of places to talk about your business model, to do your sales pitch, to talk about your personal story. New York Tech Meetup is just not that place. But, but you know, stay for the after party and talk to all the people you want and, you know, uh, <laughs> you know. So, uh, on the affordability issue, are you a student here? Uh, I was a student here. Cool, so you went to here. You, yeah, you went to Columbia, undergrad? I did, I, Columbia undergrad, yeah. Cool, how much did that cost? A lot. <laughs> a lot. I don't even want to think about that. Yeah. So, uh, so, so the average General Assembly cost, the course costs about six thousand um, dollars. It's all what you're comparing it to. If you're comparing it to Code Academy, that's obviously very expensive. Um, if you're comparing it to grad school, say, which is you know many of our students are going to are coming to General Assembly in lieu of graduate school, um, it's radically inexpensive. So it's all about what you're comparing. Right. To. <laughs> and the metrics we watch are metrics that are so in, like rigorous and intense that like grad schools don't even frame their metrics like that. Uh, you don't see a grad school referring to like how many students get a job within 90 days in the field in which they were trained. Like if anything, they'll be like six months or a year. Um, so 
we look at our product much more like a far less expensive graduate school um, than a really expensive Codecademy because it's an in-person course, like you get one-on-one -on -one time with instructors, things like that. Um, and you know, that said, there's still an affordability problem. Like I can justify it all I want, but there are a lot of students that still can't pay for it. So there are a bunch of things we do. Um, and we, we're kind of committed to avoiding the uh, entire student debt problem and like we want to be on the right side of history there. So uh, we, you know, I mentioned the Opportunity Fund earlier, which is focused on underrepresented groups and providing, uh, you know, kind of, uh, full ride or mostly full ride scholarships for, for those groups. Um, we also uh, have a number of kind of lighter touch financing offerings, like a, a kind of equity based financing um, and something. We also actually have a partnership with a company called Earnest, where we provide something that looks a lot more like a bank loan than a student loan, um, and uh, therefore is forgivable through bankruptcy, for instance. But I guess more generally, like how do you guys see that playing into sort of the general ecosystem where you do also have a lot of free offerings? Is it that they're all sort of targeting different people based on the- Oh yeah, so we, we love the free offerings. We just, the vast majority of General Assembly students have already gone through Code Academy, right. gone through Code School, all that, and that's what like made them excited and made them realize like, you know, hey, you know, we want, you know, I actually can do this, I want to learn how to do this, but you're not going to yeah. get like trained to a level that you can get a job by, right. in Codecademy. I love Codecademy, it's a great product, but like, All right, that's not an outcome. Thanks. Let's move on to the next, one more question. That was our last question. Oh, okay. Um, well, please join me in thanking my lovely, very brilliant panelists. Mm -hmm.